Good afternoon, guys. How are you? How are you doing? Doing all right. Uh, I, I'd like to start with a little bit of organization before we start with the with the class and continue with the lecture. Uh, first of all, uh, exams. The, the TA is grading his part. I'm going to grade my part uh, later on today or uh, next week. So early next week, I should have the grades. I, I didn't take a look at the exams yet, but as you turned them in, I, I took a look at a few, and they, they, they looked uh, good, but uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see later on. Uh, late uh, homework. The homework uh, for this part is going to be due next week. I haven't decided yet, but probably Friday next week or something like that. Friday, I'm going to send a lecture about about the homework this week but we're not going to have a lecture okay because i have to go to houston to talk to to some companies and uh, and so friday no no class no lecture i'll just send you send you the video so you can take a look at that at home okay uh, for the lab remember that there are people that still have to go to the lab tomorrow yes Yes. Okay. And then, uh, you know, yes. 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 Uh, very, very likely, is going to be the week of November the fourth. Okay. Yes, Mr. Dot. Yeah. The lab report is due on Monday, not next week, but the week after. Let's let's check that assignments. Lab number uh, three, yes, October 8th, 28th, and that's Monday uh, in about 10 days from now. All right? Did you say when that was due? I know, because I didn't set the homework yet. We'll see. I think today we're going to finish covering everything that you need to finish the homework. But Monday maybe will be a little bit too early, probably. Uh, I'll decide, depending on how far we get to today. Okay, so I think that's everything about organization. Uh, unless you have any question or no, um, we continue with the laboratory, with the lecture. All right, so let me switch over here. We started talking about faults and how faults form in nature. And in this example, uh, we were talking about the fault that was formed by horizontal stresses being larger than the vertical stress. Well, what I'd like you to remember is that the orientation of these faults in a three-dimensional space is going to depend on the stresses that cause such fault. And for that, it's going to be very useful that you remember what we have done in the laboratory and what you are doing in the triaxial test. So this is what you did in the, te in the laboratory. You loaded the rock in this direction, up, axial direction for this cylindrical sample, and you had a stress that was uh, a lot lower in the other direction. Because of that, this fracture is a shear fracture move or, or form in this direction. And let me see if I can. I wanted to add something over here. Uh, I wanted to bring a, another rock that I have in my lab, but uh, I couldn't find it. It's a shale with very marked sedimentary layers. But let me just fake some layers in here just to give you the idea about what's going on here. Oh, I should have, I should have done the opposite, wait. <coughs> okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this example later on because I should have done it in the other direction. But uh, the main idea here is that in this type of formation, or oh, let me do it, let me do it, I think I'm gonna make it. 
if we have layers like this and if there is a shear fracture those layers are going to be displaced with respect to each other and how the fault forms and the orientation is going to depend on the orientation of the stresses but everything I, trust me, everything you have to remember for this, it might look sometimes a little bit difficult, but everything you have to remember is that the fault plane is going to be in steep plane with respect to the plane in which the maximum stress is applied. And it holds if this is like this, or if this is like that, or if this is uh, in a, the with the maximum horizontal stress coming in horizontal direction and the minimum in horizontal too. I, I'll get to this in just a bit. One more thing I'd like to mention, you see all those grains of sand over there that came out of here? You, you know this, these areas uh, over here where the rock has apparently like smaller grain size? That's what is called fall gouge. And it is grinding of the rock in the plane of the fault. And that occurs especially when you have a large displacement relative to each other. And many times in that fall gouge, uh, the grain size may be uh, small enough that that also uh, could trap some uh, buoyant fluids like hydrocarbons. Okay, so again, let me summarize this. Uh, the same mechanism that is happening over here is this in which if you have the minimum principal stress in this direction and the maximum principal stress in this direction you're going to expect always this fault to be at a steep angle with respect to this plane and if you know this because sigma 1 is higher, this one is going to move into this direction and the one down is going to move into the other direction. All right, so let's apply this now to the three stress regimes that uh, we know. And some of you, that you didn't know that very well for the exam. I hope that by, by now you should know that very well. All right. So we'll start by talking about first the strength of faults and then about the direction. All right. In any rock, fail in shear at a small scale or at a large scale, there is going to be a maximum stress respect to the minimum stress. Let's assume that this rock already has a pre-existing fault. And it's oriented at an angle uh, which is the most favorable angle for shear failure. What we would like to know in this case is what is the maximum stress, sigma 1, as a function of sigma 3. And if you remember, we learned about this for failure of rocks, especially for unconsolidated sand, we said that if we don't have cohesive strength, and in these planes of faults, most often you uh, do not have any cohesion, so the interface has no cementation, and it has only frictional strength. And it could be, it could be this piece of rock, right? that it doesn't have any cohesion, but it has frictional strength. And we have seen that because of that friction, even though if the rock is not cemented, 
you can have a maximum stress that is proportional to sigma 3 according to this parameter q, where q is equal to 1 plus the sine of the friction angle, 1 minus sine of the friction angle. And the friction angle, the bigger the friction angle, the higher the stress you're going to have in uh, direction uh, 1. And this parameter q, if for example, friction angle is equal to 30 degrees, the parameter q is equal to 3. So that's relatively large. That means that if you have an effective horizontal stress, let's say of 1,000 PSI, then on vertical direction, you can put 3,000 PSI. The, the rock is, or the fault, doesn't have any, any cementation at all. But just because of the frictional strength and the friction grain to grain, it can resist quite a large stress and isotropy. And uh, this can be up to three for this particular friction angle, which is a typical friction angle. So the maximum that will be therefore equal to three. All right, so what does this mean in the context of, of faults and especially on horizontal stresses? It would mean that you could add a stress on one direction, which is going to depend on the strain in that direction. So here with epsilon 1, I mean the strain in the direction 1. So if, if you add stresses, let's say that at the beginning sigma 1 is equal to sigma 3. and you keep on adding stress little by little. Because of elasticity, we have learned that the more strain you have, the more stress you're going to develop. And there is going to be a limit for that, which is this limit over here. So what I'm doing over here is a very similar to what I do over here, let's say sigma 1 starts at the value somewhere over there, equal to sigma 3. And then I keep on increasing, I keep on pushing, and there is going to be a point in which you're going to reach the maximum. When re you reach the maximum, that's going to be the maximum value of sigma 3 that you can apply, which in this example, we could say for friction angle equal to 30 degrees, sigma 1 maximum is going to be <coughs> 3 times sigma 1. So let's try to, to understand what, what's going on over here. In this range that we could call an elastic range, we can use our equations of tectonic strains in which stress is proportional to strain and a Young modulus and also the Poisson ratio. So you remember that when we increase the tectonic strain, we add stresses. But those stresses cannot increase forever. And the maximum value is going to be given by the friction capacity of the faults, and this is going to be the maximum value. So in this range, it's not elastic anymore, and uh, we could call this range, which is plastic. And even though if you keep in increasing the strain, the stress is not going to increase. So in the elastic region, let's do it with this one. In the elastic region, you push, 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 but it's not really moving. But once it gets to the maximum, then starts displacing, displacing, and that strength, at that maximum stress, is not going to be zero when it's uh, moving, but it's going to be this maximum value. And when you form a fault, 
and the hanging wall moves with respect to the foot wall and you have this displacement, uh, that's going to mean that the fault is as at its maximum capacity and the maximum stress is controlled by the frictional strength of the fault. So that's the maximum value that we can attain in the in the lithosphere and the earth crust. Uh, you can increase it by tectonic strain, but there is going to be a maximum. And what that maximum value is, is in general, this relationship between the minimum principal stress, sigma 3, and the maximum principal stress, uh, sigma 1. And we're going to put it now in the context of uh, actual stress regimes. But before we do that, let's see the general case, because the general case is going to apply for all cases. All right, there is one more thing that I, I would like to know from here. The first one is the maximum stress anisotropy between effective stresses. And the second one is the angle at which that fault will develop if it were to form. And in order to do that, now we're going to have to go to three dimensions. So same example as the one above, but now I'm going to acknowledge that I have the maximum principal stress in vertical direction. I have the intermediate stress sigma 2 in the direction of the paper. And I have the minimum principal stress in the third phase. The question here is what is going to be the plane at which we have the maximum ratio of shear to normal stress and in which this fault, if it were to form, would form. And in order to see that, remember, just always think about, about this case. So if we have the maximum stress in this direction, uh, let me put it the other, the other side. This is going to be in a steep angle with respect to the plane in which the maximum stress is applied. And here is where we have the additional thing. In this case, if you know this, you wouldn't be able to predict in which angle this is forming, if it is like this, or like that, or like this, in a perpendicular direction, because in this particular experiment, sigma 2 is equal to sigma 3. But this is not the case. Sigma 1 is different than sigma 2 and is different than sigma 3. So when you do have one of the stresses which is the minimum and is larger than the intermediate, that plane of the fault is going to be a plane which is going to be is going to have be a, at an angle that it is at let's call it angle beta where beta is going to be 45 degrees plus friction angle divided by 2 but also that plane is going to contain the intermediate direction. And because of that, in this particular case, notice if we consider this is a vertical direction, the strike of the plane is perpendicular to sigma 3. But I think the easiest way to, to notice this is that the angle is going to be measured with respect to this plane, all right? And then also the plane is going to be, is going to contain this line. Let me improve my, my, my drawing here because it doesn't look that it is exactly in the direction of the plane, but it is, it is that plane. If I were to draw the, the hidden side, it would be like that. It is that plane that we're looking at. And, and notice that 
again, it contains the direction of the intermediate stress, but also this plane and these two sides are going to move. This top side, the hanging wall, moves down because sigma 1 is larger and also moves against sigma 3 because sigma 3 is the lowest. And that's why that plane forms like that. It wouldn't form, let's say, with this strike in this direction and pushing against sigma 2 because sigma 2 is larger than sigma 3. Why would it push against sigma 2? Uh, nature is lazy and always going to try to push against the lowest stress. In this case, the lowest stress is sigma 3. Goes down along the direction of sigma 1, pushes against sigma 3, and the angle is 45 plus friction angle divided by 2. And this rule is going to apply for all the systems that we're going to see. Any question about that? Yes. Yeah. So the length of the arc is not changing, it's just moving with respect to the other one, right? Yes, okay. yes, just moving with respect to the other one. It might compress a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, w with here, uh, I, I mean that the overall movement is, uh, is uh, moving with respect to the other part. Okay. Um, Let's see an example. And it's going to be uh, linked to this first example. And let's go to normal faulting. All right. So the three stress regimes, for those of you that do not remember, are normal faulting, strike slip, and reverse faulting. And we'll see, we'll see now why those are called normal strike slip and reverse. For normal faulting, the vertical stress is higher than the maximum horizontal stress and that's higher than the minimum horizontal stress. So let's imagine a place with normal faulting in which, for example, uh, you, you may not want to draw this right now because I'm going to erase some things. Where you have a horizontal wellbore and some fractures. And because we know that the, the fractures are in this direction, and let's say this is east, north, south, uh, what is the direction of the minimum principal stress according to this diagram? East. east. It goes east-west. So this one is SH min. Uh, if we look at particular location over here, this one is going to be SV. And in this direction, we have SH max. All right, let's apply what we learned about mapping of fractures and faults, but in general it applies to fractures and to any plane in three dimensions. What is going to be, if I assume that these fractures are planar and have this shape coming out from the, from the plane, what is going to be the strike of that hydraulic fracture? Strike angle phi is going to be equal to what? Remember the definition of a strike is the angle between the north and the intersection of the plane with the horizontal plane. So the strike is going to be extra points. Anyone wants extra points? And I have a, an additional price for you. If you answer, what? What is the strike? 90. 90, okay. I'll, I'll. That's, that's your price. I'll tell you how to use them later on. Oh, no, no, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I have to take back. You say 90, right? Yeah. No, 
No, the strike of the hydraulic fracture. Zero, very well, Mr. Duro. Zero. The strike is zero because it is, it is the angle between the intersection of the hydraulic fracture with the horizontal plane, and that's going to be a line that goes north-south. Therefore, the strike is zero, right? What is the dip of that hydraulic fracture? Uh, I, I can hear if I don't hear uh, Mr. Dodd. 90. 90 degrees, very well. Uh, dip is 90 degrees. So we have now characterized the, the strike and the dip of a hydraulic fracture in this domain. And you know, if you change the direction of the stresses, you can always tell what is going to be that strike and that dip of, uh, of this hydraulic fracture. All right, next question and, and more uh, difficult. What is going to be the strike of a normal fault in this particular place? Again, for extra points and additional gear. Yes. And okay, the te but tell me, tell me the strike. What is going to be the strike then? And and uh, tell me, I need to write this in degrees. So no, it's zero degrees. Okay, I I I'll give you, I give you that one. It's zero degrees. So it's going to be a line or it's going to be a plane which intersection uh, is going to be in direction uh, uh, SH max. It's intersection with the horizontal plane is going to be in direction SH max. Okay, but before I draw that, what is going to be the dip of that, of that fault? Oh, it's 90. No. All right, uh, something I didn't tell you is, let's assume that the friction angle is equal to 30 degrees. So what is going to be the dip? 60, 60 degrees, very well. And towards the east or towards the west? You, we, we don't know. You, you actually, you, you cannot tell, okay? You cannot tell, but this is going to be a fault that probably goes down into this plane like that. And if we assume some displacement, that means that this is going to go, it's going to be like this. And let's assume that we have another fault somewhere over here. And therefore that hanging wall has to go down for the normal fault. And this is going to be uh, the, the result. So for this uh, ideal, ideal faults, let's call this one number one and this one number two. Dip of number one, the strike for the two of them is zero degrees. And the dip is for number one, 60 degrees to the east. And for number two is 60 degrees to the west. Uh, this is what is called a conjugate solution because you actually, we, it could be, both of them are equally likely to happen. Uh, yes, uh, you, you have a question? Because of this equation, I know that the maximum, the plane with the maximum stress to normal effective stress is going to be located at 45 degrees plus friction angle divided by two. So in this case, the friction angle is 30 degrees and this is 15, 15 plus 45, that gives you 60. So the dip 
which is the angle between the horizontal plane and the angle of uh, maximum slope in the fault, that's going to be uh, 60 degrees. L let me try to see if I can do this 3D. I'm not completely sure I'm going to be successful. But so this fault, if it's getting out of the of the plane, is going to be something like this. All right. Notice that it is not vertical. It, it is at an angle. And how much displacement there is between one side and the other, that's what we say is called fall throw. All right. Yes. Well, well, no. That this this is where we need to uh, we need to say when it's going to be different, when it's going to be not. Is this angle is going to be the deep angle, but just for normal faulting, okay? Just for normal faulting. So uh, it, it's is this uh, example clear for normal faulting? Yes? Okay. Well, now we're going to apply all of these, but for also strike slip and reverse faulting. But what you have to remember is that it's just always this rule that with respect to sigma 1, your faults are going to be equally likely to happen either like this as, as steep planes from the direction of sigma 1, and they're going to contain the intermediate stress, which is going to go in this direction, and are going to be sort of quasi-perpendicular to sigma 3. Sigma 3 goes in this direction. And we're going to see how that applies now for uh, strike slip and, uh, and normal and reverse faulting. Let's see if I remember anything. Um, okay, uh, no, I think, I think we're going to continue. All right, so all right, now with this knowledge, we can get to know what is the ideal orientation of faults or what is similar to get to know the most likely fault to reactivate or to slip in shear. It's going to be the same. Uh, but let's just think now about ideal orientation of faults. So we're going to divide this page in three. Here we're going to have normal faulting. Uh, yes, sorry. Normal faulting. And uh, we just said that whenever we have this case, and I'm going to put SH mean in this direction, SV. an SH max, then we're going to have ideal fault planes. They are going to be steep with respect to the plane of the maximum stress. And it's equally likely that you have it, in this case, deep into the, to the east or the west. And here, for all these cases, I'm going to assume that this is the east, this is the north, this is in direction down. And of course, it is normal faulting. This is the condition. And uh, let me see anything else.
and let me just summarize with we just wrote before uh, let me call this one number one so for one strike is zero degrees deep is uh, I'm going to assume also for all these cases that friction angle is equal to 30 degrees this is just an example okay the friction angle could be different but just to make it simple this one I'm going to assume that is 60 degrees so this is deep in 60 degrees to the west number two has a strike of zero degrees and the deep is 60 degrees to the east okay uh, that's what we just did before let's do a few more things stereo net where this is north, this is the east, west, south and these are the deep angles where this is 30 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees alright where is number one going to be located? Any, anyone can tell me can tell me that so let's start with the strike okay you tell me stop I'll, I'll start here no nobody told me stop <laughs> so okay so number one number one is, is the orange one I don't know if you can see very well but it, it is this one okay so I go again so it would be just for the strike okay nobody tells me stop it's, it's, it's here that's the one right and then if I want to get now the deep the deep is 60 de degrees so it's something like that so that point is going to be here number one what about number two I'll let you think while I, I mark my extra points in here. Is the other side, and uh, what do you mean with the other side? Okay, you're right. So let's see. Just give me one sec. All right, yes, so number two is going to be here. That's how those faults will plot in the net projection. And one more thing, I'd like to know, in a Morse circle, where those are going to plot as well. So, I think so far you have seen 2D more circles. Today we'll start talk about 3D more circles, but we'll not get into detail about what those 3D more circles are. But the, the only thing I want you to remember from here is that this rock is failing in shear because SV and SH mean. This is the maximum, this is the lowest. Therefore, if I have a friction angle in this case of 30 degrees that means that the Morse circle involves sigma h mean sigma v and we don't know yet the value of sigma h max but let's say somewhere over here and there are going to be two additional circles in between those two okay my question is within the all the possibilities within the 3D more circle where is going to be fracture 1 and fracture 2 
is going to be right here. That's the point. That's the shear stress and the effective normal stress at the fracture, at failure. The point that has the maximum uh, ratio of shear stress to effective normal stress. They're in the same location in the Mohr circle. And and what it is very important also here from the Mohr circle is that if I have sigma h mean and sigma v, that circle is going to have a center somewhere over here, and the angle between the angle between this line that goes from the point of the failure to here is going to be uh, two times beta, where beta is friction angle plus uh, friction angle divided by two plus 45 degrees. And let me complete here. Uh, this one is beta 2, and this one is beta 2. Remember, the angle from the plane of maximum stress to the plane of the fault. All right, so it was the same thing that we did before, but now we added the stereo net and we added the Mohr circle. Let's do this now for strike slip. So this one will be uh, normal, and then we'll go to strike slip. All right, for strike slip, to which is the highest stress? SH max, then intermediate is SV, minimum is SH min. And just, you know, to make it uh, look closer to, to this type of, of sample, I'm going to draw here this uh, cube such that I put the maximum direction or the maximum stress in direction, of course, of SH max, but also I draw this cube with the longest direction in direction of SH max. So this is going to be SH max, maximum stress. And I'm, I'm shading that, that plane. Intermediate is going to be SB. And minimum is going to be SH min in this direction. OK. Now, now it, it gets a little bit more difficult. First of all, for extra points and additional price, what is going to be the dip of those faults? 90 degrees, very well. And uh, because if you remember, these faults should form like this. And with respect to the vertical direction, this is 90 degrees. So let me write here, deep, 90 degrees for number one, number two, 90 degrees. We don't say east or west because it's 90 degrees. All right, now the difficult question. What is going to be the strike of those faults. How much? 60, 60 degrees. Uh, no, I don't think so. OK, speak up if you want your extra points on your gift. Yes, uh, Mr. Dugan, again. No. 
So let me help you. What does that look like? 135. Let me, let me think about that. I uh, know. No. No. No, no 45. Look, look, you know, what, what would be this strike? Zero. And what about that strike? 30. Who said 30? You said 30? So notice that uh, this angle over here. So this is like this, right? The angle from the here to here is 60, right? Therefore, these angles uh, over here, uh, they have to be 30 degrees in the middle. So uh, l l let me draw that. So this is going to be something like, uh, let me do one and two. Let's say this one is one, and this one is number two. Okay, the rule remains the same that this angle is equal to beta. Or if you wanna look at this side, this angle is equal to beta, all right? But we need to measure strike always with respect to the north. And this is the line of the north. So if this is 60, if this is 90, this has to be 30 degrees. And also this one is 30 degrees. So from the north, uh, the strike for number two, uh, I, I, I messed up with the, with the colors here. Wait a minute. This is number one. This is is number two. For number one, that strike is going to be 30 degrees. And for number two, the strike is going to be 360 minus 30, which is 330. But let me write it in a simpler uh, manner. It's going to be from the north, 30 degrees towards the west. And I get this 30 degrees because it is 90 minus 60. If I had another friction angle, the strike would be different. So for these uh, strike slip faults, then uh, let's just look from the top. If I have the maximum stress in this direction and the minimum stress in this direction, these are gonna always going to be vertical faults with strike that depends on the direction of the maximum stress. And the maximum stress is gonna go through the middle of those faults and they're going to orient on the two sides. All right, so we are, I think we are just one minute. For those of you guys that got the cards, let me know what, let me tell you what to do with those. So. In order to do this, and you can use it in the exam, what you have to do is you get two cards, and then you cut them ha halfway, and then with the scissor, and then you put them together, and that forms the, the cross. And for this one, what you do is you cut it as a half, a circle and then you cut over here and then you join these two parts and there you have your fault with your pole pointing down all right all right guys then again uh, there's no uh, lecture uh, here in class on Friday I'll just send you the video for for the homework see you next week
I, I have to decide that, but probably Wednesday next week. 